Racing. Fighting. Sports. No matter where you want to go, the possibilities are endless. Man, this thing goes on forever. With Nintendo 64. I don't know if you remember this, but the first time we actually talked was on Retro Roots. And there was a particular episode of Retro Roots. Uh, that was your first guest appearance. But that also was, uh, I think, the only episode that I actually had, I guess, kind of, I'll just say, direct control over. Because uh, Nick and Mike, my, my fellow co-host there, uh, there's a lot of knowledge there. And they like to talk about facts. They like to talk about things that happen. And um, interesting, I always like learning about new stuff. Um, and it's always fun showing off what stuff you've also read on the internet. Uh, but I, I don't know if it necessarily makes for engaging conversations, uh, whereas opinions do. Uh, so on this particular episode, it was my idea to have the topic of games other people like that we don't like. Do you remember this? Uh, uh, yes, I believe so. That's vaguely okay. Correct. Uh, so I, I wasn't exactly dominating the conversation at all, but I, it was just like I dropped the topic in, everyone was on board with it, but I just kind of sat back and we enjoyed bashing our unpopular opinions against each other. Right, right, right. And that's where, kind of where you came into it. And that's probably one of my favorite episodes, actually. Uh, things were going exactly as planned until you threw a monkey wrench into the works, as you often do, by somehow taking control of the conversation without taking control of the conversation and getting me to talk about the things I liked about the games that I hate. So if you had to, if you had to force one, if you had to find one positive about Contra 3, could you find one? Yes. The uh, the music is really good. Um, mm -hmm. And it's still, it plays, it plays, it plays pretty well. And then later I was like, that was, how do you do that? How do you get me to talk about the, the positive things about a game that I look for every opportunity to publicly criticize? Right. So I, I think that's where I privately asked you, are you like a marriage counselor in real life? <laughs> no, I mean, it, it always came from debating, right? Mm -hmm. It always came from like, you know, whenever I would debate with friends or whatever, it was always like the one of the things I figure out is, the best way to make your point stronger is to debate yourself in on the other direction. Mm -hmm. You know, I, so I think I'm always trying to look at things from multiple angles instead of like, okay, here's my hard opinion. Have I really questioned myself on that? Yeah. Have I really, really, or am I just emotionally spitting something out? You and I all, I think, just still have a very similar way of we would rather talk about emotional things than cold hard facts. You yeah. mainly more come from a perspective of we disagree on this but where can we agree like yes. I, I kind of feel like that's where you're that's the whole point of master yeah. debaters like that's yeah. the whole idea yeah i see you're wearing a, a very topic appropriate shirt um <laughs> i did we're it. gonna talk about <laughs> yes <laughs> uh we're gonna be talking about the n64 today uh so i thought that it would be appropriate with you to instead of telling you uh, how much I hate the N64 and how much you're wrong for all your weird opinions about it. We'll talk about the things that I like and that you and I both like about the N64. So I, I rustled up together a, a list of my five favorite games on the N64, and I'm assuming you've done the same. This is kind of a little awkward, but I actually brought my I actually only brought reasons why I hate the system. So I, I hope that I hope that. This didn't bring a, monkey, I see we, a little monkey. This is why we need to have conversations before <laughs> we. <laughs> but yes, no, I have the, I have the, my five favorite, my five favorite game ready, okay. ready to go. I'm here to talk about positive things, so this is going to be a positive conversation. Don't worry, N64 fans. I struggled to come up with five. I'll be honest, just <laughs> <laughs> want to be open about that. You and I are roughly the same age, so I'm guessing you were probably in high school when the N64 came out. I'm 27, so yeah, uh, no, uh, yeah. I was, uh, yeah, let's see, so 96, um, yeah, I'm about 16, 17 years old around. Okay, so I was, um, I think it might have come out, I might have been a junior in high school, maybe maybe a senior, I don't know. Okay. But, I mean, that was kind of a, like a, a point where I, eh, I had other things to do other than play video games at that point. That was when I was, you know, starting to get a job, starting to have girlfriends, starting to actually have a real adult loser. social life. Yeah, <laughs> you want to have sex with your girlfriend, you loser. <laughs> um, 
so it it didn't really capture me my attention like the like the Super Nintendo had or the Sega Genesis. Right. Um, so it did kind of take me a while to kind of even experience it. However, my friends were all pretty diehard nerds. Right. Uh, so that's where all my N64 memories come from is my roommate's N64 and we played basically just multiplayer games. What was your experience with the N64 that made you so positive about it? Because it's, it, I think it's more... I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but I think it's more common for people to be negative about the N64 than positive. Yeah, well, look, I think I, I think the N64 is a system that's going to be polarizing because it marks that transitional that transitional period in the in gaming history, right? So um, you had 16 big consoles, and arguably we hit, I think, the limit of what we could do with 16 bit. Games. I think like we had mastered it by the end of the Super Nintendo Genesis Super Graphic 16 era. I think we kind of covered every angle of what it could be. And that you were even starting to see things like Donkey Kong Country, where they're starting to bring in 3D graphics to what would arguably just regularly just be a platformer. But they're trying to get out of this, what we've seen a million times over. And I remember I would always keep taking a bike ride to uh, Toys R Us. If you're unfamiliar with it, Relic from the Past, a wonderful, a wonderful toy store that had wonderful things uh, to play around with and see. And they had a kiosk of Nintendo 64, and I had known about the Nintendo 64 through Nintendo Power. Those are magazines back in the day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> and I couldn't wait to see it. And that sexy machine that loved the look of that machine. So I would bike, you know, really far away to get to my Toys R Us to see it. And I would go to that Toys R Us, I don't know, like three times a week just to watch the demo screen of Mario 64. Just watching that, um, I was blown away. And, and around this time, too, I kind of I was debating whether or not I wanted to be a 3D artist. So I was already really interested in just that technology alone. Um, so uh, that's how it was introduced to me, I wasn't. It wasn't necessarily looking at it as as necessarily just a gamer. It was also the technology and what that meant moving forward that I was really more excited about. I just have one question: What is a bike? So great question. Um, I can, here's what I can tell you. You know that expression <laughs> of like, you know, it's like, oh, it's like picking up a bike. You know, like, <laughs> well, I, okay, I recently, okay. yeah, I recently got on a bike recently. And I fell off it several times. That expression doesn't work for me. But a bike is a there's two wheels, and you get on it when you're either too poor or can't uh, can't afford a car and stuff, and you ride that, kind of like <laughs> what I need to be doing now. <laughs> so I, I guess the NC4 certainly came out in my junior year because I worked at Blockbuster my junior year, and they had displays. They had uh, uh, the PlayStation 1 display, the N64 display, and they also had these systems that you could rent. Remember this? They had like the Blockbuster yeah. cases where you rent the Virtual Boy. And, uh, so oh, I, so you, got, you basically got it as like a free, you know, you got that for free, right? You didn't have to pay for work there. I guess you can say I, it cost me the respect of my peers and that because I was playing video <laughs> games on the clock, but uh, <laughs> I'd never claim to be a good employee. But yeah, so that's where I first experienced it. And I'll be honest, I, I loved, uh, matter of fact, you know what? Let's just jump right into it. So I kind of had these ranked in more or less the, the order in which they would appear likely on everyone's list. So my okay. first games I'll talk about the obvious ones. I have a feeling this is probably going to be on both of our list. Uh, Mario 64 is one of my favorite N64 games. I first experienced it at Blockbuster as the uh, dis display unit. Always fascinated by this game. Uh, and it... Uh, it is a game that I've uh, heard described as, uh, maybe even you described it as having joyful gameplay. Is that was that sounds like something? It sounds like me. It, it sounds like me. it's true. Probably more so than most other video game characters of that time, whether it's on the N64 or the PlayStation. Mario is just a joy to control in that game. It, it doesn't uh, really have the same structure as uh, Mario. Any Mario game that came before it but it doesn't really feel like a black sheep. It doesn't feel weird. It feels like a logical progression of the Mario uh, the Mario formula. I don't know if it was the first 3D game. I think Bubsy 3D uh, might have actually been the first 3D, 3D game on the PlayStation, maybe. 
I, I don't know historically, but but what a great example of like how you don't do <laughs> Yes. So it may not have been the first 3D character to run around a 3D world, but I, I obviously Mario 64 definitely set the standard. And I, I think that the uh, the idea of having uh, like kind of smaller self-contained worlds with multiple objectives to accomplish in that same world, I think most people have found that's just, just, just the best way to do 3D platformers. Uh, and that's something that um, all the Mario games that I know of, at least the 3D ones, have uh, done since then. Um, I'm not really sure. I've never played Odyssey, so I don't know. I'm guessing it's probably the same thing. I, in a sense, yeah. And and that's a whole other discussion because I, I, I always take that that really hated opinion that I think Odyssey's very overrated. Good game, great game, but over uh, really <laughs> overrated in my opinion. But real quick uh, 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 about Mario 64 there, and you see I'm trying my best to say Mario instead of Mario. The way I, I appreciate that, I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, so many things to talk about uh, about that game. Just the idea, how brilliant the idea of that you start out in just an open, essentially an open garden. And it's just like, here, just enjoy movement. The mm -hmm. joy of movement. Just jump around, swim, nothing can kill you. You're just getting used to, you know, like even just the, like when you, when you run in a circle like that Mario leans in, just that is great. And that you've kind of, oh wow, if I jump three times, I do this flip and I can do a butt stomp and all this other stuff. But even more impressive was that not only did Nintendo say, okay, we're gonna make an analog stick, right? We're making that because in a 3D world that that makes sense, right? Almost like a trackball in a sense. It makes sense in this world. But they went one step further and said, Oh, well, what if I just tilt it slightly forward? Oh, Mario tiptoes now. Mm -hmm. And let's make that a mechanic, right? Like, oh, I can, I can, they, they, they saw that and they said, oh, okay, maybe you can tiptoe past piranha plants not to wake them up and things like that. And, and so suddenly then it also dictated momentum or typically in the 2D world, right? You had some form of acceleration you hold right and eventually the, you know, uh, reaches the game limit and your character is now running at whatever speed. But here, not only did they take that, that stick just for 3D, Worlds, but they also used it as an accelerator. They used it as a, a way of gauging am I walking, am I tiptoeing, running. And the fact that Nintendo got that right, right, I mean right out the gate, mm -hmm. is a level of mastery uh, that um, is, is just so incredible that, that, that when you look at Super Mario Brothers, how important that first world was I think you could make a very easy argument that uh, Mario 64, just that open arena, that right there, mm -hmm. uh, is its own perfect world one one. It's yeah. just flawless. So uh, that's a good, that's a great pick that you've done. Um, what, what a rare, what a, what a rare find. <laughs> I figured you'd be go, hey, me too. But uh, yeah, no. I have it, but it is not. If this is your, are you going like five, four, three, two, one? That no, th this is not in order of preference. This is. Oh, this just is just a general like talk. Yeah. Yes. Um, I have it too. For those sweet. exact reasons. Yes. <laughs> I, I had a feeling. So I had a, I made a mental list of the games I thought you would um, whip out in your five. That was yeah. one of them. So. Yes. And, and I, I, I can't. What, What's amazing to me, I've said this on a million different shows, including my own. Um, what's so fascinating to me about the game outside of everything I just discussed, I, I think it's pretty obvious that all 3D games that we've have, have, we've had since then are still, you can still see the foundational roots that still come from Mario 64, just in the same way that most 2D platformers, you can still find those roots right down mm -hmm. Super Mario Brothers. So, the fact that they just nailed this, as I keep saying, immediately right out the gate, is just a stunning achievement. And when you think about like, you know, how many different console generations we've had on other platforms, can you think of anything that did something new that was as iconic, that had that big a ripple through the industry? You could maybe argue 
and you, you know you absolutely could argue a Wolfenstein or a Doom, but these kind of games are very rare. You find some that just got it right out, you know, and it's just a thrill. To, it's really fun to play, obviously. Um, I've actually never beaten the N64 version. Um, I okay. played it tons of times. The only way I beat it was on the DS version. Yeah. Um, better version which, anyway. Yeah, I think it's better. It looks better. Uh, it has more playable characters. I think they, um, Wario, Yoshi, and Luigi all had different abilities too, right? So you had to use them. It's been a while since I played it, but I think you actually had to use them with a, a small amount of strategy to like, acquire all the stars. I believe so, yeah. If memory serves. So you didn't have all of them at first. Matter of fact, you didn't have Mario first. I think the first one. Yeah, I don't. I don't remember it uh, too well. I've, I've beaten the N sixty four version a few times. The DS one, I was really blown away by it. It was exciting to have this on as a portable thing. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that you had Luigi now finally. Um, but I don't remember the mechanics of how that worked. But yeah, so it's. I think Mario sixty four. Uh, you'd be hard pressed to find a top certainly a top 10 list, probably even most top five lists are going to include that game. Uh, I could see well, I could see a scenario where it doesn't. I don't want to derail, but I could definitely see a scenario. Uh, can I say it real quick? Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I think I think the scenario is going to be any diehard Banjo-Kazooie is going to be, will look at Mario 64 and go, ah, and it's, and it's, it's all about Banjo. That's fair. Um, because that was always my problem with Banjo Kazooie. I saw it as just like rarest version of Mario 64. Yes, uh, I'm sure I, and I haven't even played the game. I'm sure there actually are plenty of uh, innovative mechanics and ideas they have. They're totally original. There is. Um, but it's a what's an N64 game? Of course, it's separated. We just all lost subs, by the way. <laughs> they know how I feel. I think. <laughs> Okay, I'm actually going to go with what I would consider my number five. Um, and this is the one I don't think will be on your list. Uh, but it's also nothing shocking here. Sadly, my whole list is really nothing shocking. I wanted to come up with a really cool list of like cuts and stuff like that. But it would not be truthful. These are the games I just love to death. So Star Wars Shadow of the Empire for me is number five for so many reasons. And, and it's one of those things that really makes sense if you were there back in the day. This is like 1996. The prequels have not yet been on the, not out yet. Uh, you know, we had all wanted some kind of new Star Wars anything. We were hungry for it. Exactly. Uh, and here Lucasfilm and LucasArts kind of came up with this idea of um, let's make a book. We'll write the novel uh, Shadow of the Empire. Um, and it's going to have a soundtrack effort behind it. It's going to have a comic book effort behind it, a toy line effort behind it, and uh, a video game. Uh, so it was, it felt like at the time for us people who didn't have Star Wars every day, the way people have it on Disney Plus and all this other stuff, for us who just wanted anything, wow, we were getting, it felt like a movie release in a sense, in a small sense. It was like, wow, we are getting this. So um, this game was everything to me as a huge Star Wars fan, in that not only was it a, a good game, we'll, and we'll talk about that, but as far as just a just a, um, an experience, it was the first time that I can remember in the video game world, not in a point-and-click adventure kind of game, where you were, felt like you were playing a movie. It had cutscenes in it with, with a property that I loved. It had a great score, albeit, you know, limited due to the N64 technology. Uh, but it did have a great score, and it had all these kind of variations of play mechanics and scenarios that felt like the best parts of watching a movie. Mm -hmm. I think a great example would be the swoop bike scene, and that you're on these little hover bikes, and you're chasing through, you know, a little sit environment. Um, or was it the opening where you're on Hoth, the the, the winter planet there, uh, and you're battling AT-AT, where as a kid, we would always watch that and go, oh, the, the best experience we could ever have from that was either the toy, you know, just playing with our toys, or playing some crappy, you know, Atari version of it or, or, or whatever. 
and it was just a 2D thing, but to suddenly be in the cockpit and at the time felt relatively revolutionary in the graphics, it felt somewhat real, um, was mind-blowing. And I think most people who talk about Star Wars Show of the Empire, they're going to say that, that that Hoth level, that opening, was everything. I'll cut it there, but there's a lot more to talk about. Now, I never actually played the N64 game. Uh, okay. I am aware of the uh, the Hoth level because I think that was the, the, there was a reason why they put that level first. Um, I did have the soundtrack uh, when I was in high school. I collected I collected soundtracks, and obviously anything John Williams was my favorite. And even though it was not John Williams, it still it was still very Star Warsy. Oh uh, so, so I bought it and listened to it. Um, now, if who's the main character in Shadows of the Empire? Um, Dash Rendar. Okay, so he. Uh, so does that mean that I. E. Han Solo. Okay, but does that mean that uh, Shadows of the Empire, that whole thing, the book, the the game, uh, is that a sequel to Dark Forces? I, I, that I don't know. I what I can tell you, it's meant to be in between Empire Strikes Back and Return. So it right. fits right in between them. as far as how it connects to Dark Force and stuff. That I don't know. And I didn't even read the book. Uh, the only okay. thing I know about the story of that game is what the manual, uh, the, okay. the manual, the insert for the CD of the soundtrack told me. Uh, so I'm roughly aware that it is basically what they did before Return of the Jedi. Yes. Did you read the book? I did, uh, ages ago, but yes, okay. I read it. Is, is it the, the main... Dash Rendar and the main bad guy is a guy named uh, Zizzer. But no, I didn't play. I didn't play the game. Uh, the uh, the Hoth scene definitely I uh, grabbed my attention. I I I think I actually have played a little bit of the game only up to that point because the uh, the moment that you're actually controlling the 3D character, uh, the game becomes kind of clunky. Uh, yes. So I don't know if there are any more vehicle levels beyond that. I hope there will oh, be. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, well, here's the deal. Like, that's a game, like, and this is this is a situation where if I was ever sitting across from someone and they said the game was crap, I, I like, I, I don't really have much argument with it because it really is a game that only works at the time, um, and and then that's just going to create a, an element of bias, right? So, you know, when I got to the stage where it's a third person or a first person because you change the camera angles, which was awesome. You know, like, that was one of the first times I had really ever played anything that was a third-person kind of game um, that was doing what it was doing. I think, that obviously, at that point, we had Tomb Raider, which is also a huge, influential uh, game, you know, obviously. But um, so when I played that character, I was just, like, blown away. Like, wow, I was just on Hoth, and now it's a, it's a shooter, and I get to go inside these Star Wars environments. And this is, oh, this is so cool. So... If you were to go and try to play that game now, it's got to feel really clunky in those in the same way that like a golden eye is gonna feel very clunky if you didn't kind of start with that kind of memory. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think you would like this game, even if we could transport back to the time because and, you know, correct me if I'm wrong about you here, but there isn't necessarily anything to to get good at because it's always throwing you into a different type of game um so you know in a, one minute ago you're, you're piloting an x-wing now you're literally a, a third person shooter guy running and shooting people and then you're on a swoop bike which is a hover bike and that has its own different mechanics so it's always throwing you around it would seem more focused on i'm going to tell you this story and you're going to play these really fun movie scenes as opposed to i'm going to make you a great game with Great mechanics, great controls, you know, stuff like that. So yeah. you, you you might just like the experience as, you know, but I don't think you'd love it as a game. I'm sure you're right. I, I don't think that I'd especially like the game because I kind of played other games like it. Um, like I didn't play. What was the one that was on the N64? Was it Rogue? Was Rogue Squadron on the Rogue N64? Squadron. Okay. Yes. Uh, so I didn't play that one, but I did play Rogue Leader. That was uh, on the GameCube. You. Amazing yes. game, love that game. Yes, yeah. Uh, and I was super excited about the sequel, Rebel Strike. Yes. I did not like it when they threw in the uh, the first, per the third person action scenes. I thought those were super right. clunky. And yes. when I went back and I played what little I did of Rogue's uh, of Shadows of the Empire, uh, I was immediately reminded of why I didn't like Rebel Strike. Sure. Yeah. Fair. Was it Factor Five that did the Rogue games? Yes. Um. They clearly thought that 
uh, LucasArts, is that who did Ro- Shadows of the Empire? We're talking about a lot of developers now. Yeah, where this gets iffy is because it, LucasArts, it was originally Lucasfilm, and then it moved into LucasArts. It's like around that period, so it, it's one of those two. I think it's LucasArts at that point. Because um, Rogue Leader pretty much did that opening Hoth scene almost shot for shot only yeah. on the GameCube graphics, and it looked amazing. Yeah. And man, does GameCube hold up. Those graphics are still incredible. I don't know if it was a launch game, but it was one of the very first GameCube yeah. games, and it still yeah. looks fantastic. Yep. But yeah, I, I didn't play Shadows of the Empire. I don't think you need to. I, I think it's worth, if you're ever interested, and so even for just the people out there, um, if you find the controls and everything a little clunky, I think it's at least worth watching a long play of someone just kind of playing it and just seeing how ambitious that game was. Certainly, I understand a lot of the reviews, even at the time, which was saying, like, really ambitious, tries a lot, doesn't succeed at any of them. And, you know, at any of them. <laughs> and I think that's a very fair review. I won't have a lot to say about this game. Okay. Um, Mario Party. And spoiler, Mario Kart is not on my top five. Because uh, I kind of, in in the long run, have felt that Mario Party was a more appealing multiplayer game. Uh, even though Mario Kart uh, definitely requires more skill and uh, is less bullshit. Uh, I kind of feel like uh, Mario Party is more, more fun experience if you're actually playing the game. Now, if you're in the audience watching people play Mario Party, it might not be as fun. Uh, but well, when has <laughs> ever, wa- like, oh, joy, someone's playing Monopoly. Can't wait to watch that. <laughs> um, but this was a game where even even though I don't really like the N64 um, at the time, I was able to plug in this game. My kids, my wife and I all picked up controllers and we just had a blast playing this game. Uh, So it kind of became the only N64 game we would play for a long time. It's utterly dependent on, it's basically like a a flashy version of Candyland. There's no skill whatsoever. Uh, You just are pressing buttons and random stuff happens. Uh, But it is a a fun, uh, very engaging experience. Uh, and I, I haven't played any of the other Mario Party games other than Mario Party 1 or 2. I'm not so enamored with the formula that I would, would follow it for another 10 or 11 games. I, I, I don't know how much more they would add to it other than more boards, I guess. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know if uh, they actually have added anything to it since then. but no gimmicks. You know, one great thing about the console is that it came with four ports. Mm-hmm. And it's... That's a bigger deal than just saying, okay, well, you know, any console, I mean, we, we had them, right? Our Nintendos, you could get the um, adapters, that you could have four players, etc. cetera. Um, but by building it into the machine on the front of the console that you're mm-hmm. always staring at not having three other friends with you, um, it, was, it was embedded into the architecture of that machine. I think it was even called the fun machine. Right? I think that was like what advertising called it. So this idea that every developer had the idea since it wasn't something that would be an add-on. It was it was guaranteed there. Uh, and almost to the point, well, if we don't do something with four players or something like that, like they're staring at these three empty ports and these, these people have brothers and sisters and friends, you know, kind of feel like we need to do something here. So it encouraged that idea of a party environment. And on top of that, that party environment also mechanically also inspires like, well, how do we get a bunch of people to play this thing? Well, it doesn't, it can't have necessarily the most complex controls. Mm -hmm. We should also offer things for people who don't don't necessarily play. Mom and dad can play. My sister doesn't usually play, can now play. And so just having these four ports on the console inspired not only great games that had a party environment, but actual mechanics to those games, um, play foundations to those games 
that opened up what games could be, if that kind of yeah. makes sense. Uh, where before we always thought almost arcade-like or or singular, I play this game with maybe a friend. Uh, but this opened up what that could be. And Mario Party, I think, is such a great pick in that... Um, what a great game that inspired that idea of, come on, everyone comes in, we all play. It's like a board game mm -hmm. that we're playing on the TV. So I think it's a, it's a good pick. And it does actually kind of exemplify a Nintendo's mindset, uh, is that the games are for everyone. They're not for, and this is something they've been kind of criticized for also, but they're not just for hardcore hardcore gamers. Yeah, They are for the your kids. They are for the two or three year and five year olds. They are for the the 80 year old grandma and grandpas who are coming to visit, uh, who have probably not touched a video game controller ever. So the simplicity of uh, Mario Party definitely worked far better as a uh, multiplayer experience for general audiences than a game like Mario Kart, which was more fun and more engaging, but you have to admit it, it does require a lot more skill and a lot more, you gotta be a better gamer to play Mario Kart than Mario Party. Yeah. My wife uh, joined us playing Mario Party, and uh, <laughs> she had to. Uh, before we before we stream, we need to play this game just so I can remind myself about how to play it. I was like, "Honey, you just you, you literally just press the button." That's as far press as it, yeah. as complicated as it gets. Yeah. <laughs> and she was like, "Oh yeah, I remember this game." Yeah. But she she still enjoys it. So, so a number four for me. Oh, actually, this is perfect. This is perfect. It still works. Is Mario 64, is the Mario Kart 64. But I'm not gonna lie, um, every time I got to this part of the list, every single time, uh, I instead wrote down San Francisco Rush. I happen to love uh, San Francisco Rush, probably more so than I should. Um, but it was, I think for me, it was because it was for the first time that I had ever seen in a racer that there was a, an exploration uh, aspect to the game, which I had never known. Usually you're just, you know, going from point A to point B and repeated a million times. Um, but with San Francisco Rush, um, you got this idea of exploration. So, for instance, you know, you could ride up on a hill, leap off of that, jump on top of a building, and on top of that building, you know, where you may have thought you brought, broke the game, you didn't because now you're seeing a ramp on the building and then you race off of off of that ramp and get to a different part of the track and then beat your opponents because you totally cheated. Um, so San Francisco Rush is just like great, fast, arcadey fun with very good controls. Um, also, you know, San Francisco is just a perfect place for a racer because there's so many hills and beautiful environments to go down. So I think the only reason why uh, I didn't put San Francisco Rush on the list and I put this instead is because I don't think that if I was watching this back, I'd be able to live with myself uh, with that. I'd probably go over to San Francisco and jump off that bridge, I tell you. <laughs> so like so many other you know, great N64 memories. It begins and ends with fantastic multiplayer, right? And uh, we, used to, we used to play the hell out of this uh, in college like crazy. Um, I remember just having so much fun with the racing, but more specifically, the battle mode, um, which was equal parts infuriating and also like tear-jerkingly hilarious. Uh, in all the fun you'd have with your fellow roommates and stuff like that. And it, specifically, we used to have a couple of shy uh, roommates, um, and it was great watching them kind of starting to brighten up and lighten up in the room and getting into the game with everybody because the game was just so inviting, so much fun uh, to play. It was kind of very pick up and play kind of game. But you know what? What I found even more fascinating about the game was just how much better it was than the Super Nintendo Mode 7, you know, original. How much more they were able to expand on that idea, right? The Super Nintendo version was this kind of very simple um, racer with a weapon system, right? Unique at the time, of course, um, but kind of similar to what I've been talking about the whole evening as far as how the Nintendo 64 was able to, you know, in this new 3D world, just nail what that could be. 
you know, when you think of Mario Kart now, I don't think any of us think back to the Super Nintendo version. I think everything we've been seeing since Mario Kart 64 is the foundation that it built, right? Um, uh, because it got everything so perfect, down to the controls, down to how it works with the, the, the weapon system, the inventory system, its battle mode play, all that stuff. The N64 version just nails flawlessly. And that formula is what we still copy to this day, right? Like, so mm -hmm. the Mario Kart 64 formula was so perfect, we still emulate and copy it to this day. Now, you know, there's other reasons why I also love Mario Kart 64. I love the music. Mm -hmm. I love the colors in it. I love the, the level design, right? Again, remember, in Mario Kart uh, Super Nintendo, it's a, essentially a flat world, right? And so here we're adding hills and t these intense turns and this drifting kind of system and everything that just feels fantastic on the controller. Um, I also, I know a lot of people don't like it. I also love that uh, 3D sprite look, you know, what we saw in Donkey Kong Country. Um, I happen to love that look. So I was, I love that the characters um, looked very 3D cartoony, something that you would not have been able to achieve with polygons. Um, so I love that look. So yeah, Mario Kart 64, I guess is, it's it makes sense. It's That's your Mario Party is my Mario Kart 64. I think we both had very similar great experiences with them. Yeah. And I don't think you could go wrong with either one. But for me, Mario Kart 64, I'd kiss it, but it'd be creepy. And I don't want you to lose theaters. Well, as it happens, uh, when I made my list, I came up with my first four games somewhat quickly. Uh, and my fifth game was, it was... Mario Party, Mario slash Mario Kart. I wasn't sure which one I was gonna pick, and when I was digging through my drawers uh, to grab the cartridges to hold up in front of the camera, I just so happened to grab Mario Party. So I just said, "Well, I guess we're choosing Mario Party tonight." Uh, but I would say that Mario Kart was probably the probably the number one game that my roommates and I played. Um, my sister and I, we each independently had uh, PlayStations, and our game was actually Crash Team Racing. Uh, I, I think that's the best, car from my perspective as a PlayStation right. owner, that was the best uh, go-kart racer of that generation. Uh, but none of my friends liked it. And uh, there was also no, there wasn't four controller ports on the PlayStation. So we all played Mario Kart. Um, Did they not like it? Or was it that they were coming from an unfair perspective of like, I have Mario Kart. In it, because I was the only one of my social group that had a PlayStation for some reason. Uh, they weren't, they didn't like Crash. They didn't have that connection to the characters. Whereas, you know, we all grew up with Mario and Luigi and more recently, uh, Wario and Donkey Kong. So it just, I guess, kind of easier to latch onto that. Um, and then we also used the NC2 play uh, to play other multiplayer games too. So it was like the system was already out and just plugged in a different game. So, yep. um, and they, none of them really that were that interested in any PlayStation game. I tried to get them to play because they're idiots. Exactly. That's why we're not friends anymore. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> Shut my friends out for not agreeing with me. That's the way life works, right? Yes. Uh, so I'm glad that you picked Mario Kart. I was kind of hoping you would kind of segue into that because that was yep. also one of the games I assumed you would pick because uh, I continue to love uh, Mario Kart games over the years. Uh, my favorite one is still Double Dash. Um, yeah, that's a on great the, pick. On the GameCube. It's also one of the, the few series that I actually kind of played in sequ uh, sequential order because I did play the original Super Mario Kart a lot when it was on the, the Super Nintendo. Even though I didn't own a Super Nintendo, I still ended up playing that game a lot. And same with the N64. Even though I didn't own an N64, I still ended up playing Mario Kart 64 a ton. And then finally I had the uh, the GameCube for my myself, and that was where I... So I I have kind of followed the, the Mario Kart series all the way through. Uh, and I never get tired of that. Uh, I, I could still... I think I proved when we were playing together that I could still fall into Mario Kart 64 as yeah. if I was just playing with all my friends. Even with terrible frame rates and glitches. <laughs> <laughs> and, and crippling lag. Yeah. Um, God, it's been like, what, 23, 25 years since Mario Kart 64 was new. Is that accurate? Fuck, we're getting old. Yes, we are. Let's move on quickly. <laughs> hey, 
So, okay, so I don't actually have the cart for this, which is weird because this probably would be my top N64 game. Okay. That would be uh, Star Fox 64. Star Fox is also one of those series that I've followed in sequential order. I loved it on the Super Nintendo. Uh, I think it definitely peaked. I think everyone knows that it peaked at Star Fox 64. Um, that was just so a, good. They never could. They never could leave it. Never did. They, it they just couldn't do it. <laughs> you, you would think it would be easy for them just to keep on cranking out sequels. Just, just make different levels. That's all you gotta do. Why is that so hard? They can't do that. Uh, uh, They've had the same problem with F Zero. At least with F Zero, uh, they have made games that are extremely similar to the the first one, or at least yeah. Um, it's like they refuse to make a game that is just like Star Fox 64. Yeah, it's like so, Nintendo, sometimes it's okay to just give us a new sequel. Sometimes you have such a winning formula that it doesn't need 50 gimmicks and whole new philosophy of game mechanics. Just, just make more of this thing with some nice, nice prettier graphics. Because back to what I was saying about uh, Shadows of the Empire and Rebel Strike, Star Fox Assault on the GameCube is perfect until you get to the third person action sequences, which are very yes. clunky, and yes. all they are is just like, well, just arenas. So they're not even yes. levels. They're just like, destroy all the enemies until the level ends. But when they actually did actual Star Fox levels where you're flying with the R Wing and stuff, fantastic, beautiful, perfect game, 10 out of 10. Yes. But that's only like 30% of the whole game. That's <laughs> so, the problem. Whereas Star Fox 64 is just, uh, an actual expansion of the original Super Nintendo game where you had only vehicular levels and you had like the branching paths where you can, and I think they made it a little trickier to, to get the various, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't even know if you you know the answer to this, but I think with the original Super Nintendo game, I think you were able to kind of di dictate which of the routes you took. Am I, am I wrong on that? It's been a while since I played that. That's game. what I thought, but but now I'm second guessing myself, but that, that was my, that's my recollection. Regardless, tons of gameplay, ton, tons of replay in that in that game, uh, tons of, of variety. You can literally play uh, the game many, many different times and not see all the same levels. This was, to me, like as close as I was going to come to an actual uh, Star Wars game. Yeah. And they made it pretty clear that that's what they were doing, actually. And I loved that game so much, I was looking and looking and desperate to find a game that was identical to Star Fox on the PlayStation. There doesn't exist a game like Star Fox on the on the PlayStation, I'm sad to say. At least not that I found. The closest one I found is maybe Warhawk, which um, it ain't shit compared to, yeah. to no, Star Fox. Not. I do have one little bit of Star Fox trivia that I think most people don't know because I only I myself okay. only just learned this uh, recently. You know your your Star, Star Fox characters, correct? Yes. So yes. you have Peppy, who is a rabbit, and you have uh, Fox McCloud, who is a fox. You have Slippy Toad, who is a frog or a toad or whatever. Falco. And then Falco, what kind of animal is Falco? Well, so uh, I, I guess I would say he's a falcon. This is going to be wrong. He's like, he's like a cockatoo. Or he's he's a, a, a pheasant. So I, I did not know. And when you actually see a picture of a pheasant, he's got the blue head and the red eyes. So it obviously makes sense, but... His name was Falco. So I think yeah. everyone just assumed that he was a falcon. And so when yeah. you see people making memes of like using the real life animals, they always use like a falcon for or right, some right. kind of hawk for for Falco. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a it's a, a pheasant. So it's basically a big chicken. Wow. Well, yeah, well, I guess like Fez kind of not the most masculine character. name. Not really. Um, yeah. Falco definitely sounds a lot more badass. And yes. uh, he. He was probably my favorite character in the game because uh, he was the asshole, just like Raphael. <laughs> <laughs> so was that one of the games that you uh, experienced back in the day? Star going oh back yeah, no, I love I love Star Fox, um, uh, but it's not it's not on my list. It's it would have been you know we do top ten, it's there. Um, you know, w one thing I would add to what you were saying about Star Fox is that again I'm going to go back to the innovations of in, in sixty four and say like. Hey, that game was all about the rumble, and I, and I know we've had discussions where it's come to light recently. recently not necessarily may not have been the one. I guess was not the one who created rumble. 
They certainly were the first that I'm aware of to put it inside a, a, a controller. That really was uh literally a game changer it, it it changed the way we played games and it worked so well and enhanced that gameplay so much that every game we play now has rumble that all echoes from star fox 64 because when you bought star fox brand new it came with the rumble pack right i'm sure you could buy it separately but box was gigantic yeah uh so it's just it's weird that i don't have my favorite n64 game physically but it's also a game that Nintendo has never given you a uh, few reasons to own it in some fashion. I, I've downloaded it from the Wii Virtual Console. Right. I think I have it on the Wii U. I certainly have it on... And now they actually have it on Switch uh, Online. Yep. Have it on 3DS. I want to have the game so I can have it physically in my collection, but it's like, I don't... I don't really need to have it. I, I'm not going to play the N64 version. There are better ways to play the game now, so... Why not just play it on the Switch? Or no, yeah, why I'm not sure just that play price it? is starting to go up there too, I would imagine. Sadly, I just I think that uh, Star Fox is just one of those series that Nintendo A, doesn't really care about, and B, doesn't really know what to do with anyway. So they just kind of shit out these little weird experiments and just... Strange. Uh, it, it makes no sense to me, because people clearly like it. Yeah. They talk about it all the time, they... It, so many people put these on their top X, you know, mm -hmm. all the time. And the fact that, that, that Nintendo refused to just kind of give a sequel is annoying. Use the boost to take. I guess I should be thankful. Do a barrel roll. All right. So uh, number three on my list is... Wave Race 64. Um, there are many reasons why I love this game, but I think the number one uh, reason is because you know, when you look back at most racing games, right, what do you usually find? Well, the star of the show is the track design, right? That's typically the star of the show. And then kind of the bells and whistles are, you know, the car handling or whatever the, the vehicle is, the, the, the feel of the car, things like that, right? But with Wave Race 64, for the first time that I can remember, the unique aspect of it was the physics. That was the true star of the show. And when you have an idea of a racing game being all about the physics, what it feels like to be on water, okay, um, you better get it right. And somehow Wave Race 64 still holds up today. When you play that game, and with this controller, okay, it genuinely feels like you're riding on top of a wave. Now granted, I've never ridden an actual wave before, um, so maybe it feels nothing like that, but as far as a game is concerned, I've never had that feeling of momentum, that feeling, that thrilling feeling of kind of drifting and gliding on this rolling what it amounts to a rolling hill um and the and the bumpiness right the the all the wakes and everything of the of the water uh such an incredible incredible experience that is just as equally fun and delight delightful today as it was back then kind of to go to this reoccurring theme with me is that what i'm most impressed about uh, with it especially is that you know here they are trying to make this new kind of concept of a game where physics is a star of the show and right out the gate they expertly nail it so well that there's almost nowhere else to go with it and that you could see how much it inspired other racing games that came afterwards right you could see it in not only plenty of you know, water, you know, jet ski kind of games, but you also saw it in snowboarding games and trying to emulate that feeling of going over moguls and uh, and, and and jumps and things like that, right? So uh, they, they that was what was so perfect about it, was that it was so flawless right out the gate. Now, the graphics are gorgeous. They're still some of the best on the system, again, putting in perspective, you know, the graphics of the time, um, but they're still beautiful. The waves look fantastic. The controls, as I keep mentioning, are absolutely perfection. 
Um, and it's one of those games, probably more so than any other of the games on this list, that I would say that you it's a game that you can't watch. It's a game that you absolutely have to play in order to truly get the experience of it. Watching someone online playing it is totally different than you actually having the controller and having the absolute joy of riding uh, these waves and seeing that sunset as you're doing it um, and that terrible announcer in the background. Like it's all this perfect package of cheese and beauty and perfection in controls. Uh, I absolutely love this game. And uh, never in a million years would I have ever thought to myself, boy, you know what I want to do is play a jet ski game. Yeah. Like that kind of sounds very dull to me. And yet Wave Race 64 not only, um, you know, was such such fun to play, but it also kind of made me want to get a jet ski. It's kind of like my experience when I uh, saw Mighty Ducks for the first time and said, I want to play hockey. And so I did. Poorly. Very, very poorly. Artists don't belong on the ice. That's, that's what I'll tell you. But anyway, um, yeah, just um, this is a game, uh, probably the most unique game on this system where you it looks like even the artwork is dull, but the experience is so surprising. So uh, that's why it's on my list. Oh! That was one of the games that my roommates rented because uh, we rented all kinds of games looking for just like the perfect multiplayer game. Uh, and I think you and I were talking about this the other night that there are just so many, not so many just racing games, but so many really good racing games on the N64. I think that they, uh, going back to uh, the four controller ports and what a, a ma big yeah. deal that was. I think that just inspired everyone just to make really exciting uh, racing games to compete with Mario Kart 64, probably. Yeah. But Wave Race is one of those ones that everyone kind of talks about. Everyone kind of goes back to that one uh, because it's not just a generic racing game either. It's uh, extremely convincing water physics. Um, very impressive to look at. And uh, uh, it didn't really click for me just because I, I thought it was... It, I think it was a little too smart for me, is probably what it comes down to. I, I just couldn't wrap my head around the, the water physics to the point where I was able to just really buy into it. Uh, my roommates loved it, uh, and it's a game I actually have today, I just haven't really played it that much. I would, if I'm you, I would, get, if, whenever you're, if you're ever really bored, I would, I would say like, if, like set aside a week one time to just play Wave Race, I think you would grow to love it because once you get it, once it really hooks in, the amount of maneuvering and options and how much that opens up, opens up your mechanics and gameplay stuff um, is pretty rewarding. It is a game that rewards people who really sit and, you know, put time into it. Once you get it, man, it really is such a wow feeling. Even today, even today, it still works. Uh, that game actually was a sequel, though. Did you ever play the Game Boy uh, Wave Race? No. Oh, so wait, wait. Wave Race 64 is a sequel? Yeah, I didn't wow. know that either. And the weird thing is that Wave Race on the Game Boy, um, you, know, it's a, you know, it's a first party game, so it obviously got a big push from Nintendo. It apparently sold well enough that it was actually re released as like a greatest hits uh, pack, also. No one seems to know about it for as many copies as it apparently sold, and obviously it was popular enough that it got a sequel uh but yeah obviously the game boy play uh version plays nothing like the n64 right. version um I, I tried to play it in it it's kind of boring but uh give it, it a, is give it yourself. called just wave race it's just wave race yeah. okay and it's basically just a, a top-down uh racer like uh, micro machines i've never okay. played that one yeah um just with kind of kind of sort of water physics and it's kind of slow huh. i'm gonna definitely seek that out yeah, it's not that interesting, though. So that's, okay. the, that's the problem. So I'm kind of surprised it actually yeah. got a sequel. But yeah, I'll take your advice and I'll play Wave Race one of these days. Yeah, give it a, give it a go. Like, like, again, if you have the interest in it. Like I said, once you get it, like, it, it's, it is fun. Once you get that mechanic, it takes a while to get the hang of it. That's something that, like, that's something that a lot of people nowadays 
uh, don't have the, um, and what's the word? Oh, whatever. The gift of nowadays is so many things that we have, so many new great things. Back in the day, you kind of had, at least in my experience and many others, you'd get your game and that was your game. And like, yeah. I'm going to explore this game because the, the next time I get another one is a long time from now. That, that's absolutely true because I I don't want to shake my fist at all the kids today because I'm obviously part of the problem by giving them all this stuff. But when I was growing up, maybe, maybe just like, we are better off than our parents were back then, but it was rare for you or one of your friends to have more than one console. And you maybe got a game for your birthday and Christmas. And that was pretty much it. So everyone's library was very small. Well, and how often do you see, you know, like you'll even see streamers um, play a game. Uh, these controls suck. Uh, next. And it's yep. like, no, dude, not, not us back in the day. It's like, no, you better learn to love it. <laughs> yeah. It's like, if the game wasn't as good as you thought it was going to be, you played it anyway. Cause what else are you going to do? Um, <laughs> no. go outside and play, go climb a tree or right. something. Ah, poppycock. Yeah. Fuck that. Um, so I, I just think that, uh, not to say that generation X is better, uh, but they kind of are in the sense that by necessity, we gave games more of a chance, I think. And I, I think that's why you have so many people who are coming out of the woodwork to defend shitty games like Castlevania 64, because that was a game they had. That was a game that they blew their Christmas on by asking Santa for that game. And it wasn't very good, but they played it anyway and they forced themselves to love it. Or they at least they put in enough of their time and it, the game earned their, their love. And, and I would say, too, that it also changed games mechanically. Because um, back then, I think everyone kind of knew that the average gamer, when they got a game, that's the game they got. Where nowadays, because there's so many options, now developers and designers have to make something that as soon as you play it, you know, it's wham, bam, you're in it. And it's like it's trying to give you everything at, at once. So it's changing the slow burn of what a game could be. And trying to mechanically uh, and stimulus-wise bombard you with things. Immediately say, this is good. Keep it. Hold on to it. Don't return it. Or don't jump to the next game. You know. Uh. I think it's unfortunately everything now. But basically, video games are becoming like the the, the byline of a news article. Like, uh, d they know you're not going to commit to reading the whole article. They got to yeah, capture your attention with that, that really it. sensationalized uh, byline. So, uh, everything... Everything sucks. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> I am kind of cheating for my second to last game okay. um, because it's not really an N64 game. Is it Sub-Zero Mythologies? No. Damn it. Am I that transparent? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, I didn't actually play it as an N64 game originally, but that would be... Uh, Mega Man 64. Wow. Which is just the the N64 version of Mega Man Legends on the PlayStation. Capcom, who for the most part kind of shunned the N64, uh, they did give us a few good games. Correction. They did give us a few good ports of PlayStation games. I thought yeah. I thought Resident Evil 2 was actually pretty good. Oh, and, and a like technological marvel. They squeeze the whole thing in there. They uh, like all four megabytes. Yeah, that's the only version of Resident Evil Two that I played, and I played all the scenarios. I think Angel Studios handled that port, I believe. But I'll still talk about Mega Man sixty four as as if it was a just a traditional N sixty four game because it's still one of my favorites, uh, even if it didn't actually originate on the N sixty four. Now, are you familiar at all with Mega Man Legends on the PlayStation? No. Barely. So Capcom was basically doing this. Um, I don't know exactly where they were going with this, but I mean, they kept on making alternate re uh, versions of Mega Man. You had the, your traditional Mega Man that was on the NES, most famously, and then Mega Man X, which was Mega Man, a future version, kind of. But then Mega Man 64 was, uh, I, th I think, far, far into the future when i don't know like the, the ice caps have melted basically and flooded the earth with water and uh, it's a different version of mega man it's a different version of roll 
it doesn't really follow the storylines from the original game. It d- doesn't even play at all like it, right. anything that Mega Man did in the other games. Yeah. But it just drips with personality. Um, are you a fan of Studio Ghibli movies by chance? I, I know of them. I I, I don't I have. You've okay. recommended them. To so there is a, a Studio Ghibli movie that uh, I'm sure some people in the audience will have seen, uh, which I believe is Castle in the Sky, which kind of follows the same idea where um, there is like a temple in the sky and there are basically sky pirates everywhere. And a group of sky pirates kind of chase the uh, the heroes of the story and they eventually... They're basically like Han Solo characters, so they're they're kind of bad guys. But then by the end, you realize they just they just got hearts of gold, and so that I feel like Mega Man Legends slash sixty four was based heavily on that movie. I think that they actually took a lot of inspiration from that. So because it's a uh, uh, like a very long Zelda like, not quite RPG, but like uh, like more like an adventure game than like an, a, a third person action game. There's a lot that goes into it, so I'm not going to bore you with the details. Uh, but I would absolutely recommend playing this game, probably on the PlayStation, uh, if you can find it. If nothing else, for the adorable freaking serve bots. Because I, I know you've at least seen those. Nick-chan! We're so sorry. We lost the team. Oh, what happened this time? I can't take my eyes off you for a second, can I? Just you wait till we get back. You're in a lot of trouble. Oh, no. Even back when I was iffy on these weird, clunky 3D games, I loved Mega Man enough that I was I was willing to follow him into the third dimension. So uh, I think that was the only, only real 3D game that I allowed myself to really get into. I didn't really follow Tomb Raider that much. Crash, it's hard to say that Crash Bandicoot is really a third, a real 3D game. Yeah, it's a, th- it's a- 5D-ish it, it's basically a 2.5D game, but your perspective is at his yeah. back. So it, it it's not really a 3D game. But those are the games I was playing. So yeah, they're great. Mega Man Legends is the only game where it was actually like a an actual 3D game, and uh, they did this a really cool thing where their character models were the faces were not made of polygons. It was like a, a graphic so that okay. uh, they actually had like cartoonish expressions. There was tons of, I, I guess you call them cutscenes, but it was like a, a cartoon that the game was showing you. It used the game engine to show you the cutscenes, right? Uh, which was at the time kind of a rarity because the, a lot of times the graphics weren't sophisticated enough to actually show you a, um, a proper uh, cutscene. So a lot of times those games that time, Google it kids, they would cut to either a full motion video, which looked like yep. shit, or they would use, they would cut to um, like some kind of weird primitive CGI uh, cutscene, uh, a la Resident Evil 2, uh, to name one. Yeah. Mega Man Legends actually used the actual in game graphics, so it, you never once got taken out of the game. Right. Uh, and just so much, so much personality. If you have any kind of soft spot for cuteness or quirky anime stuff, which I don't know if you do, it's worth experiencing. And well, you've sold me on it. Yeah, no, you've sold me on it. I had always, uh, I was never a Mega Man guy. I have no issues with it or anything like that. And, it, and I remember when Mega Man came out on the N64, I just went like, oh, wow, that feels like for the first time ever that Capcom just did like a cash in. I just assumed, I'm like, because I looked at some of the graphics, I went like, this looks nothing like Mega Man that I'm aware of. But it looks like they just kind of went with a clunky, you know, third person kind of game. And it's probably just fluff or something. That's why it's actually an exciting pick. That someone would actually put it so high on the list. I definitely want to try it because uh, obviously it's got way more meat on the bone than I was, uh, that I was aware of. That's great. Yeah, so it's it it's nothing like any other Mega Man game you play. Yeah. But... Um, I think it, it, because of probably all the things I just rambled about, it latched with audiences stronger than many other games from that uh, from that era. Uh, you get people who, uh, uh, who may not like any other Mega Man game, but they love, love Mega Man Legends or Mega Man 64 with, with all their heart because there's, there's just so much more there uh, right. to, to latch onto. 
I think what also hurts stings a little bit and what makes people kind of cling to it so much is that Capcom has not revisited it. It was uh, Mega Man Legends 2. Right? So it did get one sequel, one proper sequel, which ended on a cliffhanger uh, leading oh. to a Mega Man Legends 3 that we never got. So people are still kind of clinging to it. I, I was curious, to, like, uh, how long that I imagine you beat it. Like, how, how long is the game? It's a, a pretty typical third-person action game length. So okay. probably you can finish it in less time. I'm sure you can. it would take you to finish Ocarina of Time, I'm sure. Oh, wow. Okay. I would say that it also has more personality, though, than uh, either of the Legend of Zelda games on the N64. I'll just go ahead and throw that out there, and a lot of people will agree. Some people not. So, does it have the same? Uh, I mean, I, I, it doesn't sound like it does. Um, you know, die hard, tough as nails gameplay. So no, it's it's a little more accessible. Yeah, it's in, uh, in a different because way, it I guess. because it doesn't play anything like that. It right. It's worth mentioning that it also predates, at least on the PlayStation, it predates the the dual uh, dual shot controller. Uh, okay. So. You're literally just stuck to four cardinal directions. The N64, at least, that port does help with that a little bit. So it was made for the... Okay, smoothens out the rotation. You can control Mega Man with, you know, 360 degree movement, but you're still stuck to the same... This is kind of hard to describe, but you're still stuck to the same four cardinal yeah, it's, directions. It's, it's grid corridor kind of system. Yeah, and you're and you can really only move the camera in ninety degrees, so it's kind of awkward. Or you can okay, very clumsily stick the camera to Mega Man's back. It's it has all the issues of most three D games of that era. Okay, Mario sixty four definitely beats it hands down uh, for the player experience. Well, it's not even the same but game though, right? It's not even. There's no platforming in the game, hard, yeah, yeah, or at yeah, least yeah. hardly any. It doesn't require the the full fluid move set that. Mario 64 did. Well, you've sold me on it. Like I, Try it I, out. I, I, yeah, yeah, no, a hundred percent. We'll definitely check that out. The the fact you're even just saying the word adventure already piques my interest. A guy like me, you know, because Mega Man to me is the the the, the mainline games are way above my uh, my uh, my ability to play them, um, or at least devote enough attention to get good at them. So if this is more adventure esque, I'm more inclined to be open to that. Yeah, if you like games with personality, uh, I, oh, yeah. I think you do. Uh, then yeah. absolutely, I think you will at least find some things to love about the game. I'm sold. Hopefully, people in your audience are also sold because that, that that's the fun thing about it. Yeah. Most people watching this video, I think, uh, I've already played it. Already agree with me on that because oh, okay. it, it has a very strong following. Uh, okay. Of loyal fans that probably like it more than many other Mega Man games. Okay. Just a guess. Just a theory. Uh, leave a comment to let me know what you think about <laughs> the Mega Man Legends or Mega Man 64. Yeah, because like that would. I mean, what I like about that pick is that of all these ones, like someone could come across and like, oh, okay, hey, that's one I would have never thought. And like they're coming out of it. Where do you see my number five? Dun dun well, dun. I'm excited. gonna cut to a commercial break right there. Is it Buck Bumble? Leave some mystery to the audience, for <laughs> fuck's sake. No! What are you standing around for? Put out the fire! Put it out! The automated fire extinguishers aren't working! What? What? what, what? Is it conceivable? How could a little punk like that ever defeat me? to build that in the first place. I'm gonna get him. It was the last thing I ever do. I'm gonna get him. Now, before we move on to your last game. Yes. I mentioned earlier that I'm so arrogant and I think I know you. I think I got in your head. I've written down what that game is. Okay. I will say this. I I think at some point I had told you what my game would be and I changed it. So I don't know if it's going to be that. We'll see. 
We'll see. Is this the game that was uh, tragically obscure? That was originally what I was going to say for my number one. I've changed it. Okay, well, I'll just show you what my, my guess is. No, you okay. show me, yeah, because I want you to change it. So you show me what your game is. I am going to change it. I, I will get you excited at first. I will hold up Stunt Race 6. I will hold that up. It's not that one. That's not what I thought it was. Oh, okay, good. Oh, okay. Okay, so technically Super Mario 64 is my number one. This is my number two, but it's pointless to talk about because everything that's needed to be said about the game has been said to death. Uh, my number two pick, Zelda Ocarina of Time. A surprise to no one. I'm out. <laughs> what did you put? Uh, I thought for sure it was going to be F-Zero X. You talk about no, that game all I, the time. and I love F-Zero X. So I can't even tell you how many times I had to redo this list over and over and over again because I have so many favorite uh, N64 games. Uh, Perfect Dark at some point probably would have been on this list. Uh, I love that game even more so than Goldeneye. I know that's blasphemy to some. Um, I even love Pilot Wings 64. Uh, that was like the only other game that came with the N64 when it first released. And I played that arguably more so than even Mario 64 at times. Um, Beetle Racing, Beetle Adventure Racing, such an incredible game. And of course, San Francisco Rush, which I keep talking about. Um, so there's a lot of games that I wanted to put on this list. F-Zero would have definitely been right probably in number six spot. Uh, so when just isolating it down to my uh, top five, these are you know games that I can return to over and over again. Uh, not only relive a lot of the old memories that I had, um, but they're just genuinely great games for me as well. But, but Ocarina of Time specifically, um, you know, so so long we were playing Zelda, we knew Zelda as this kind of like, for the most part, a top-down kind of game. And it's all about adventure, right? And and even, you know, even with Zelda 2, which is kind of a side-scroller, um, these were adventures that you're watching, you know, sideways or top-down. Uh, and that doesn't make you feel like you're on that adventure. Ocarina of Time makes you feel like you're going on an adventure, especially back then when 3D was so new and unique to us. The fact that when we got to Hyrule, Hyrule Field and you could see the vastness of that, that landscape and the depth to it, and the fact that you could look at something and go, I want to go there, and then you could go there, right? And that it was this kind of feeling of open exploration. That is something, an awe and wonder that I wish so many other people got to experience. But if you didn't grow up with that, then you've just been bombarded with 3D games your whole life. But for us, who only knew Zelda as this little sprite guy with a top-down or side view, to suddenly see that world that we, our imaginations had to fill in the gaps for, suddenly was told to us from a great storyteller, right? That was just shown to us and we got to explore that world. That is a reason alone that Ocarina of Time has to be on this list. You know, and another great thing about it too was that it still managed to feel like the original uh, first one, the, the Legend of Zelda, right? Um, because what I loved about the first one was that it was this really great mystery of a game right where where you'd be on the playground with your friends and you say like oh, man you know what i accidentally burned this tree and it revealed the staircase and your friend is saying oh wait i actually on this part of the map i moved a boulder and i found this this secret and did you know that you can you don't have to do the levels in this kind of order i played it differently here blah 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 like so there was all of this great wonder and mystery that was in that first game that they really managed to really inject back into this one, except this time it was in a lush 3D world, right? So I loved that experience again, except instead of being a kid doing this, now I'm like in college saying, uh, do it on a smoke break. Hey, did you know that uh, if you do this and this happens? Like, you know, it was, it was just felt good to be kind of a kid again. It's, it's easy for us to look back at Ocarina of Time and say, boy, that was a great game. Or, you know what, it, it was overrated. You know, it got a lot of things wrong here and there. It's it's not what everyone remembers. If you play it now, it's da-da-da. Like, all that stuff is just background noise to the fact of, let's go back to the perspective of Nintendo going faced with the task of, 
what does a 3D Zelda game look like? And they're faced with a blank piece of paper. And the fact that what came from that was Ocarina of Time is an achievement that's hard to really put into words. So for me, with all that, that's why Ocarina of Time has to be on the list, even if you don't necessarily like it. Um, no, I'm not going to say that Ocarina of Time is overrated. Just like Mario 64, everyone is going to put that game on their list. Except for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> except for me, apparently. However, um, that was a game that uh, also my roommates had. And I had this weird memory of when I was living in Texas with my roommates. For Christmas one year, there was like four of us living in this, in this big apartment. And independently, we all just kind of went to various parts of the country to go visit our family for Christmas. And I was the last one to leave. Uh, there was like a, this big ice storm had swept through Austin. So the, the airport was all frozen over. Planes were stuck. It was like it was like Die Hard 2. And so I actually had gone to the airport and I just got sent home. And my parents were trying to get me on some kind of plane to get me to come to California. Right. Uh, or else Christmas will be ruined. And so that day, as I'm waiting for some kind of response from uh, the airport, I sat down and I started playing... Uh, Legend of Zelda. This is just give you an idea for how long I was waiting. Uh, I got through all of the, uh, the, the the opening scene where you're you got to go save the tree and then leave right. the, the woods. Uh, that moment was somehow kind of magical for me, where I didn't ever want to revisit the game again because it would kind of ruin that memory of right. yeah, the excitement of am I gonna actually see my family for Christmas? Am I just stuck here all winter yeah. and then having this experience I actually had the N64 to myself all the roommates were gone and I was able to play their game uh, so it had like this this cool moment for me coupled with the idea that I've never really been that interested in the Legend of Zelda series in general so I, I didn't really follow it for some reason I years later played Wind Waker and I absolutely loved that game and for the many of the same reasons I love. Especially uh, the charm, I would imagine. Yeah, um, that that works on me. I'm, I'm weak to yeah. that. So that's many of the same reasons why I love Mega Man Legends. And I always maintained, without actually ever playing it myself, that Wind Waker was better than Ocarina of Time. Then I got the 3DS version of Ocarina of Time, and that's the only way I actually played all the way through the game. And that's where I realized... All right, so Ocarina of Time actually is better than Wind Waker, but not very far removed at all. I think that uh, Nintendo has been basically remaking Ocarina of Time ever since then, except for maybe like Majora's Mask might be different. Well, Breath of the Wild was was then re now saying we're yeah. Gone. I mean, up up, yeah. up to a certain point. Yeah. Um, obviously, Breath of the Wild was probably they going were always back remaking to... Ocarina of Time. They were always remaking like yeah, like that was the. Yeah, it's amazing to me how well the dungeons in Ocarina of Time hold up. That's one thing I didn't really, didn't really love about some of the older Legend of Zelda games. Um, and what struck me about Wind Waker is how the dungeons was just like one big puzzle, and it was just like ingeniously yeah. designed. And it's like it's so satisfying to finally reach this one switch that unlocks the rest of this sequence events that you can finally do to finally get the key to go beat the boss. I realized when I played Ocarina of Time 3D that it started with Ocarina of Time, that those dungeons are the ones that are just so incredibly well designed and Wind Waker is the one that is basically just kind of aping that. I, I didn't even have a problem with the Water Temple. Yeah, you was. may have been alone on that one. A lot of us had big problems with that. <laughs> um, but I yeah. think that doesn't the 3DS version, it, don't they rest that or something? I, I could be wrong. Maybe something. that's why I didn't have a, a problem with the water temple. That's the only yeah, way I Yeah, I think I've they did the... something <laughs> that made it a little bit. I could be wrong. Sorry, I just like walked all over your segment with my own. No, no, that's that's what there is. What's to say? I mean, what's to say that that hasn't already been said? Uh, everyone knows it by now. It's either going to be on your list or it isn't. I would just argue. I would say that people who don't include it on the list, that's tricky for me to understand, even if you don't like the game. If we're, look, if we're talking about what's your favorite game, I totally get why it's not on your list. As far as when you're talking about the N64, what, what should be there? 
that's there. People are screaming at us about Goldeneye, and they're screaming at us, uh, at us about Smash Zelda. Brothers. I can understand that. But Zelda and Mario 64 belong in that list, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and there, to be fair, uh, I, I will admit, there are a lot of, and you love to preach this bullshit, but there are a lot of N64 games that are big because of what they represent. That it's like what they started. The, the people who do things first, I think we often forget, are the ones taking the biggest risk. They're taking yes. the biggest risk. They're putting everything out there. Uh, you know, sometimes those risks look like this thing. You know? um, and that thing that inspires and gives way to better ideas. And so uh, without them, that's why I think they're so important is because it's very easy to say the newest thing is the best thing. Obviously, because yeah. it had everything before it to improve upon. But to get in the frame of mind of limitations and risk with what any new idea is usually faced with, to see how they came out of that and came up with a great idea is, in my opinion, everything that should always be studied mm -hmm. and championed. Because it inspires us when we are limited and when we need to take a risk, how we can think a certain way. How did they succeed in this? That I can think outside the box with the limited limitations that I have to make something great. Yeah. Uh, that's my two cents. So are you ready for my my last game? So uh, let's play. Let's let's have some foreplay with this. Uh, okay. Okay. So this is, you know, I, I, I got to applaud you on the Mega Man one. Uh, so this is kind of just out there yeah i have got to imagine it's not going to be a third person effective game because you already said that it was it was Mega Man himself that made you gravitate just towards it and take the risk so it's not that i don't think it's a racing game either because i'm thinking of the racing game i'd say stunt race 64 and beetle adventure racing are quirky-esque kind of games those are great but outside of that i can't think of anything with charm the hell does that leave? It's not a sports game. It's not Mario Tennis, by the way. That's where Waluigi's from. Because mm -hmm. they needed a partner for Mario. Had I known if you played Mischief Makers or not, I think that would be my guess for you. That Mischief Makers makes the most sense for a guy like you. Although I don't think it's that, but that would be my guess. Mischief Makers. Okay. It's not Mischief Makers. Yeah, I so um, I guess I'll just set the table for you a little bit. So I had a friend... Uh, one of my friends that owned a 64 and he was mainly into, we all played multiplayer games together, but he on his own was probably the most into video games out of all of us. And he would go out and he would research games uh, just based on IGN reviews and, and whatever other websites were on at the time. So he wouldn't buy games just based on uh, whatever commercial came out or whatever one was being talked about the most. Right. He was buying games based on, what was IGN giving good scores to? What were, what were actually, I'm what were the informed. critics actually paying right. attention to? So he was the only one to give like a game like Paper Mario a chance. Uh, um, so he, those kind of guys. And he had a game that I had never even heard of. Um, and I think I ended up liking this game more than he did. Cause I would always ask to play this game when I went over to his house. That would be uh, a rocket robot on wheels yeah because of mario 64 3d platformer character games were everywhere uh, everyone needed their own mario 64 uh, yeah and yeah. it was like it was just a like, mascot craze all over again in a sense. absolutely so it also in, in some ways it was worse because a lot of yeah. those mascots from the genesis and super, super nintendo they also got their own shitty uh, 3D. Uh, Except Awesome Possum did. Awesome Possum did. It, it didn't. And I, early Acrobat like, didn't make it on the, uh, <laughs> into the 3D realm either. And obviously Mario 64 was a template for a lot of these games. Because that's just the idea that works. You got like these self-contained areas with specific objectives you gotta do within each smaller world. So you're, you're end up having to revisit the same stage and just playing it a little differently every single time. I always say this game actually does that better than Mario 64 with the variety of things it's having you do within the in the worlds and also because you're 
instead of stars, you're just collecting tickets, basically, to open up the next world on the uh, the, the hub map. Have you played the game? Because uh, you didn't seem surprised to see it, so. Believe it or not, it's not as maybe as rare as you may think that it's on people's list. It's hmm. on, um, you know, like less of the Mojo, you know, like on YouTube, like the Mojo Top 10 and 64. Or like the real gamers. On When you look at a real gamer uh, YouTube channel, whatever, Rumble channel, whatever, people who really love the system or love games in general, who are more likely to give other games outside of like a lot of the generic titles that, like I've given, who really go outside of that. Um, that you'll find that uh, that and Mischief Makers a lot of the times is in the top three. One of those games is in the top three, and that's something that I knew a few years ago, and I've, and I've always been looking to get that game out in the wild, and I never could find it. So I've never played it, but I've heard nothing but glowing positive reviews for it yeah it's really good it plays really well uh it also it, it's got that cute character that i like that, that will draw me to the game what's um, its gimmick like what's the uh characters i guess his gimmick is um he uses like um i don't know why i'm drawing a blank on the word but he he basically can pick up objects and move them around uh, okay and you gotta do like the obviously do the normal stuff that you'd expect to do, like stack blocks so you can jump up higher. Yeah. Uh, or carry a key over to a door and unlock it. But other than that, it's a fairly straightforward 3D platformer um, that just happens to play really well and have a lot of fun and interesting ideas. So it's fun going into an area and tracking down all the various objectives you have to complete because you don't need to, just like Mario 64, you don't need to get all the tickets or the the, the stars essentially to right. move on to, to, to you just have to get enough okay but there's like one where you um, have to build a roller coaster and then if you build the roller coaster correctly it'll take you into one of the stars or tickets basically there's a lot of a lot of imagination in the game yeah it's, it sounds like it's got a little bit of wit to it yeah I, I haven't played the game in probably about 20 years Partly because I'm afraid it won't hold up as well as it does in my head, because it is an N64 game, and uh, games for that era, especially the 3D ones, I, I, I've just kind of found that the PlayStation, probably even the Saturn also, N64, they may have been great at the time because there was nothing really to compare them to, but more so than even the NES or Super Nintendo games, they've been improved on so much that it's just hard to go back to the very beginnings. Thank you very much for indulging me in this uh, little conversation. I uh, probably won't get too many more opportunities to talk about the N64, at least to this level. Uh, I figured you were a good person to do that with since you have a tendency to make me talk about things I like when I Crap, don't, you don't want, want to talk, talk about. about. Yeah. Next colonoscopies. <laughs> Where can people on YouTube who are open to other experiences find you? Uh, primarily my main focus right now is on uh, rumble.com. You can follow me there, uh, pandasub2000. Um, and that's where I'm really doing kind of a lot of live shows because as I'm working on that saga series I was talking about a little bit earlier, um, in the meantime, I'm doing that in the background. I'm trying to produce as many great live shows as I possibly can, but I try to do something very differently than um, you know other channels out there. I'm trying to trying to give kind of more of like a G4 feel. So I goes to a shoe store in the uh, the other day, and the clerk runs out the door after I says to him, "I'm looking for a new soul. Soul as in shoe. That that deserves better. Let, d d hit it again. Okay, I got another laugh. Thank you. Where the the shows kind of feel more like shows, right? Um, you know, there's different camera angles. There's big virtual sets, um, things like that. I try to have um, thematic shows, kind of like a game like uh, Death Bet, where um, the chat takes wagers as to when I'm gonna die in a retro game, um, and it's a lot of fun. There's in-game currency and stuff like that. Um, and there's other shows yeah. I'm working on that are going to be interactive with like, I'm like almost like a Mario Party kind of thing where live guests come on and I built the virtual uh, board game that they're going to be playing on. Long story short, blah, 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 blah. 
I'm always trying to do things uh, a little bit outside the box. This is a famous movie scene, okay? And you're not seeing the full scene. I'm showing you just a snippet. Um, and I send those over, uh, edited over to YouTube. So if you don't want to go over to Rumble, that's fine. Uh, you can find the replays. They're edited on YouTube. That's Panasub 2000 at uh, YouTube. But I would, I would argue that um, most of the fun um, at least for me, is the live chat. And so I love I love it when people are there live and interacting and having fun, like again, on a death pit where you're wagering with your fellow chat and competing to get uh, high on the leaderboards, things like that. Um, so that's where you can find me. I'm also on X and Instagram at Pandasub2000. Well, thank you so much for having me. This actually was a lot of fun. Um, Hopefully, I don't know, I hopefully uh, I was able to bring a little bit more extra appreciation to the N64. Maybe there wasn't some before. I don't know. But um, at least there's one thing we can agree on. We both love the GameCube. So there's that for whatever that's worth. We do. Uh, I think we, we both do. Maybe we'll come together and have another conversation about the GameCube games we love or yeah. the Wii U games we love. That, yes. uh, of course, you just look at the Switch library and uh, appreciate those games. What I want to see is it like, I want you to do an effect where now the, the camera dollies out from you and taking your shit on an N64. I thought he did take your shit on the N64 though. I think and I got all my dicks literal, a literal <laughs> shit. Okay, maybe for Rumble. Maybe for the Rumble editor. Yes. I'll, I'll put another piece in there. <laughs>